rolling. We are rolling. Okay, so this is our second video, and I'm going to hopefully get better at this as we move along. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of videos, and I realize I have a lot to say in the video. The whiteboard format is really good. This is an important video because what it does is it kind of lays out my attitude towards a lot of different things. Um, I am not a tech person, meaning I have brushed up against tech kind of again and again and again. The important points in how we call what we call tech has evolved. I was around for the beginning of desktop publishing. I was around for the beginning of a lot of things and played kind of a significant role in small parts of things that happened. But something happened in the early 90s that most people don't understand and don't know about. And it's significant because it has a big role to play in how things have been ever since. And where we are right now, when we think that we're getting somewhere with what we could call communications technology. So very quickly, I'm just going to put communications technology up here. Now, I've got to keep this simple because I can go on and on about what we call communications technology. But let's just, uh, let's just call it the technology part. Language is, is a technology, but we won't get all philosophical right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to around 1991 to, I would say, 1994. Okay. Now I, in 1986, was a part of the beginning of desktop publishing in Seattle with a group called the Ventura Users Group, uh, which was led by a guy named Chad, Chad, excuse me, Chad Candy, and also had a fellow named Byron Canfield who was involved and a couple other people. And what, what was going on is back in 1986, desktop publishing became viable, and it was in 1987 that I spent a few years being involved in some of this. Now, I'm primarily an illustrator and a comic artist, and I like doing that kind of thing. I had been waiting for a game box to make an appearance, and what it was is it was called the 3DO Multiplayer. And the 3DO Multiplayer, I had been waiting for it because I was interested in what was being said about the technology that was involved in the 3DO multiplayer. Um, it's an important box. We have to sit, we'll just put that it was an important box, okay? Um, I demonstrated the 3DO multiplayer, which was presented as a gaming platform, for about three years in department stores and got to know it pretty well. What I did was I also got on the mailing list for a lot of the support situations that were involved in this. For instance, the software developers, and then what was happening at the time with what we'll call CD Tech, okay? Now, what most people don't understand is that a CD conference happened, and I don't know where it happened. It may have happened in Japan or someplace like this, but what happened was the standards for CDs were reached, okay? And we're gonna put a list of people over here. We're gonna start with Philips, and then we're gonna go to Sony, okay? Philips and Sony more or less controlled the CD technology in a lot of ways because Philips more or less invented it. They had a very large disc, which was a CD long ago and far away, and then it got down to the standardized size that we got to know in the standardized form formats that we got to know. And what made the 3DO multiplayer important as a, as a, we'll call it a tool, was that this small box was available for $400, okay? Now, this $400 box was ready to be hooked up to your television. It was ready to be hooked up 
to your telephone. It was ready to be hooked up to other computers. It had uh, a setup for VR goggles, supposedly. It had a trackball thing going on. Uh, and it was set up for absolutely every CD format that was available, okay? Now, back then, Kodak was kind of a big deal. Now, something that was interesting about this period of time is uh, right to CDs supposedly didn't exist and they were not available. So we had CD-ROM and CD-RAM, okay? So read-only memory, CD read-only memory was still going in 1994, supposedly. Now, the reason that that was bullshit was basically somebody got mad at somebody and they had a recordable mini disc set up on some of their keyboards and sequencers. So if you had a recordable mini disc available on your keyboard, well that meant to over here, write, write memory or, you know, read-only memory was basically bullshit. But they held on to it for a very long time because it was a cash flow situation. Now, this $400 box was actually being offered at a discount by the time I was ending my days with this company. The company I was involved with was called BDS Marketing, by the way. Uh, and BDS Marketing was kind of cool. And the company that was producing the 3DO was a company called Panasonic. What it was using was a RISC chip, okay? And I forgot what the acronym RISC stands for. Uh, reduced Instruction Sustainability, uh, uh, who knows? No, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but this was a superior chip, okay, at the time to Intel. And this chip, was produced by Motorola. Okay, now, why is this interesting? What makes this interesting is that at the same time Panasonic was producing this 3DO box, another box was being produced, which I saw at a trade show, which was almost the exact same box, which was produced by Apple. And Apple's products at the time, they had a Power Mac, I'm not sure what it was called, that was again running off of this RISC chip technology. This was better than Intel. And Intel was running the IBM and IBM clones, okay? The PC as we know it. So what we have here is a list of companies that were part of what we could call the CD standard situation. Uh, what was going on with these boxes and the rest of it. So we can add, oh, at and and Panasonic were involved. And for some bizarre reason, Time Warner was involved. Okay, this is all part of what's going on with this. So we can put Motorola on here. And because of the risk chip, we can put Apple on here. This is all involved in what's going on here. Now, what's going on with IBM at the time, you have to realize that there was an odd situation with IBM and Microsoft, okay? Microsoft, at the time, was having antitrust issues. And Bill Gates, I don't, we have percentages of increase here, I suppose, but his, his wealth was not that big of a deal. Bill Gates in 1994, he might have been worth, oh, I don't know, at most, We'll just say $10 billion. All my numbers are going to be wrong. We'll just call it $10 billion. You know, he's a rich man and he's worth about $10 billion. Well, this is wrong, but it's good for, you know, the parameters of what I'm saying here as a story. The issue is basically for operating systems at the time, we had discussions of a system called Chicago. OS2, uh, I forget the names of what was going on with a lot of this. Oh, and then Apple and Microsoft were having issues with Windows because 
Windows was a ripoff of, it really was a ripoff of what Apple had come up with. And Microsoft was kind of ruthless. And their acquisition department was kind of ruthless. And their, the way they treated people who were supposedly competition was a bit ruthless. Anyway, so here's 10 billion bill, IBM, Microsoft, antitrust. A risk chip in Apple products and the 3DO, which is actually superior, made by Motorola. So we have Intel and Motorola happening here. But the big deal is this $400 box. And while I was demonstrating this box in department stores, I would talk to people about the internet. Because I talked to a lot of tech people. And in 1994, they were really excited about the internet and what the internet was becoming. And so I'd be sitting there demonstrating the box, and then these people would come up and we'd have these long conversations. Meanwhile, I was on the mailing list for everybody. So I'm on the mailing list because I was, you know, I was interested in this product. I'm on the mailing list for everybody. I'm getting promotional material for future wireless, future this, future that. I had two big boxes of correspondence with these companies because what was what was interesting to me is what this meant for graphics, basically. This had a, this, this had a phenomenal graphics processor, by the way. Who? Uh, graphics processor. But it was only running on a 32-bit system or bus, right? It was built to be expanded to a 64-bit bus. And the kids that would come up and look at the game, because it had a few games that were really good, they would go, well, you know, uh, Nintendo's going to expand, and this is only 32 bits, and they would complain and whine. But, but the main thing was is that this was not really a gaming box at all. Gaming box, not. Okay? This was a miniature computer. A very cool miniature computer and it was ready for the internet okay so it was ready for the internet because of this connection to the phones and everything else this little box was ready to expand it was ready for the internet uh, it was ready for CD-RAM which already exists it's uh, connected to all of these companies okay this is one hell of a box so the issue is what happened? Why didn't every kid in the world get a $400 box? Why didn't everybody get a $400 computer that was ready for all of this? What happened to our $400 computer that was also available at Apple trade shows, right? Um, what's, where did it go? Okay, so what's very interesting is that during this period of time, or slightly after this, I went to another trade show. And I went to a trade show where basically they had a uh, raster printer. Okay. It looked a little more refined than that, but we'll pretend that's the raster printer sitting at the trade show doing things. Raster printer! Yay! Okay. And over here on a table, we have a guy on a stool. I am stool, yay, with a computer and a bunch of shit going on like this. And we have these two technicians, right? Technician one, technician two, right? Dave walks up, that's me, <laughs> and I I think, well, great, because I'm into these large graphic files, and I, I think they're cool. So I start walking around the machine. And this guy goes, what are you looking for? Right? And I go, I'm looking for the slot. He goes, what slot? And I go, the slot for the CDs. Right? Because I know that this shit, this is, the, come on, this is a $400 box for kids. The stuff they have sitting around in their, whatever, their laboratories. I mean, this is, we're, we're advanced to the point where you should be able to walk up and put in a CD and it just does a few things and the raster printer is ready and it does whatever you need and so I'm looking for the CD slot. He goes, oh no, there is no CD slot. He points over to this. This is 1995 or thereabouts. 
This is a computer. You buy the computer to hook it up to the Braster printer. You buy the printer. The computer costs sixteen hundred dollars. Right? Well, that's four times the price of this, right? So it's sixteen hundred dollars for this Braster printer. And uh, oh, and then you have to buy software, right? Now you just it needs a computer to be run, and then you need various software to run that. To run that. No CDs. This. Now I, I don't know if you noticed the difference between this and this, but we might as well call this two thousand dollars. This is why every kid in the world in 1995 didn't have a four hundred dollar box, because this is where the money was. Also, what was interesting was that Intel and IBM, right, and Microsoft hit an agreement. Now, let's pretend that. Uh, remember Eisenhower and the military industrial complex? Okay, the military industrial complex. Um, let's just pretend that communications, primarily going through AT&T as a funnel, or whatever, are important to what could be called a cartel of people. We'll call them a cartel, whatever you want to call them. But his, his problems went away his antitrust problems just kind of went away, and this is a condensed version. Uh, when he agreed to work with IBM and Intel at a certain level, and then we were done with Chicago OS2, and Apple got a consolation prize because of their close relationship, in my opinion, with Motorola, which is that they were told to wait. Because what happened during this period of time was that Bill Gates very quickly went to $60 billion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, very, very fast. And so what we can do is we can do simple math, and this math is wrong, but because my figures are kind of made up, they're, they're roughly accurate. But the main thing being is, let's call this 60 million, 1% of the total cash flow. And I'm being basically uh, generous and conservative probably a lot more than that, or a lot less than that. 60 billion is a lot less than this. Because the agreement to not have this $400 box for kids and everybody else uh, was reached. And these guys all made a great deal of money, and it was priced out of reach. Most kids, most people cannot afford $2,000. Now let's add to this list some other people, right? We have Philips, Sony, AT&T, Panasonic, Time Warner, Motorola, Apple. We can put IBM on here as well. In fact, let's stop with IBM for right now because basically IBM is connected to every other industry in the world. That's international business machines, right? Okay, so international business machines is kind of insipidly like advertising. Advertising is connected to every industry in the world. So, <laughs> what we've got, when we talk about Bill Gates being a philanthropist, and when we talk about all these guys being good guys or whatever, when we talk about the communications industry, right, what we've got here is the kids could have used these $400, $300, $200 boxes. They really could have. I, I know I could have. Pe poor people could really have used this in 1994 as opposed to supposed philanthropic generosity or whatever you want to call it by Mr. Bill 20 years later, okay? Also, the reason that I'm bringing this up is because the main players in this, Motorola for one, okay, are, are, are directly involved in what could be called cell phones. I'm still calling them cell phones. But I don't know if you've noticed, but basically we can now call them smartphones. Okay. Smartphones. Motorola. Oh, what happened to the risk chip, by the way? I'm sure it's still being used for something, but Intel, of course, made a lot of money because, well, PC clones running these machines. It should, this should have been a risk chip doing something crazy inside the machine, not some weird Intel cobbled together nonsense happening outside. Anyway, uh, we don't need to worry about that right now. 
What we have is, who are the main players today? Well, Google, for instance, is a very interesting creature because they make phones. And even though these guys are in the background, right, they still are the main phone. And it's sort of like Exxon isn't really even on the stock market right now, or they seem to have gone, <laughs> taken a back, back seat maybe. But what they really are is they're directly co connected to Chase Manhattan. This is Rockefeller and some other characters from long ago. Um, it's interesting to take the robber barons, that's a very interesting book, the robber barons, and see how the old tech is connected to the supposed, well, it is new tech, and that happens right here. So, the old tech is represented by things called Westinghouse. Okay, Westinghouse bought the monopoly on alternating current years and years and years ago. And Westinghouse, Morgan, and Chase, people like that. This is old money going way back, okay? Why am I bringing all of this up? It's to complement basically what I'm saying about the communications technology, or the communications, we'll call it the communications industry. The industry of communications. Why are we having so many problems now? That's basically a good question. We have 5.2 billion mobile devices on Earth. Each one of them an overpriced version, so to speak, of what this used to be, right? So Moore's Law, which I use loosely, is doubling every 18 months of what semiconductor, what basically was made up by a guy at IBM. Bellamy Moore, who uh, noticed that maybe it was transistors or maybe it was the microcircuits were doubling in their ability every 18 months. Uh, I believe certain technologies like solar panels, uh, the output of 3D printers, there are certain things that seem to double every 18 months, even though they're not semiconductors. But the reason that this rough math, this very rough math is useful the same way that this very rough math is useful here, is to see what is going on with us. What's going on with us? 5.2 billion mobile devices, okay, on Earth. We have a political situation presently which is insane, which is really being brought about, no matter what you say, by the people who, control is a big word, but why do we call it control? Okay, Google makes phones. Uh, Apple is the biggest customer of Amazon's cloud. Um, there's a lot of goofy shit going on in what should be simple communications on the level of communications technology. If this had been fair, really, since 1994 or 5, it would have doubled to our advantage meaning that we would be walking around now with little solar-powered computers, like sort of like calculators or whatever, that basically cost about, I don't know, 400 becomes 200, 200 becomes 100, 100 becomes 50, 25, $10, $1. The difference between this and this is what's really going on now while we're walking around thinking we're clever with our smartphones. So far as I can tell, all that they're being used for now is surveillance and very little to our advantage because the main issue here is that IBM, the industry, and whatever, the issue isn't the climate. The issue isn't, the issue is the climate. The climate is a major issue, but it's really an aggregate, okay? We live on Earth. We might as well call Earth the aggregate. So we have 5.2 billion communication devices, let alone our cars, which are kind of like mobile devices, and a bunch of other things that are mobile devices. You might as well call your car a telephone. Um, on this aggregate earth, is all of this is about is extending cash flow for what amounts to Exxon and Westinghouse 
and a couple of other people time Warner for as long as possible and then do they plan on just kind of cutting us out of the picture sometime because we're collateral damage I don't know but I do know that the story of this box and where we are now is very interesting this is simply wrong okay and uh, what, what to think about these people who have gained so much from withholding so much and that's more or less it for now so thank you very much and there'll be more later bye